Hi, my name is Dan, and this is my 1969 and a half A12 Plymouth Roadrunner. Um, I'm excited to make a video um, highlighting this car, what it is, the history of the A12 cars, and the specific history of this A12 Roadrunner. The A12 package is special because it only came in one year, which was 1969. And it came halfway through that model year, which is why we call these cars 1969 and a half cars. The package consisted of a larger engine. So you got Chrysler's largest engine, the 440 cubic inch big block. And that engine had a special induction system. It was a three carburetor, induction system on a special intake made by Edelbrock. The center carburetor was 300 uh, 350 CFM and the two outboard carburetors were 500 CFM each for a total of 1350 CFM with the accelerator pedal pushed all the way to the floor. Behind that big bad 440 engine was one of two transmission options. You could go with the 727 torque flight three-speed automatic transmission, or you could go with the uh, heavy-duty A833 18-spline four-speed manual transmission that was preferred by drag racers. And then all of the A12 cars got the Dana 60 heavy-duty rear end with a 410 gear ratio out back that really got these cars moving quickly. But what's most notable about these cars, at least visually, is this flat black lightweight fiberglass liftoff hood that really made these cars stand out, especially with the gargantuan hood scoop that you can see here. Now, this is the only car in American muscle car history to ever come with a fiberglass liftoff hood. Chrysler didn't produce the A12 cars to sell a bunch of them. They built the A12 cars to win races. It was racetrack credibility. Throughout the 1960s, the big three, Ford, Chrysler, and General Motors were constantly trying to outdo each other to build the better, bigger, and faster cars at the racetrack. They knew if they won at the racetrack that it would in turn create more sales at the car dealerships. So by the late 1960s, in stock eliminator drag racing, it was the Cobra Jet Mustangs that were dominating and the A12 car was Chrysler's answer to those Cobra Jet Mustangs. When I purchased this car, I knew that it was an A12 car, obviously. I knew that it was a four-speed car. I knew, I knew that it was a coupe. Um, so there were some things that I, that I knew, but there were a lot of things that I didn't know, things that make this car uh, even cooler than, say, the average A12 car. And um, those things are uh, that it's a very early car as far as the A12 cars are concerned. In the production run of all A12 cars, all of the Super Bs and all of the Roadrunners, this is car 17. So it's one of the very first A12 cars to roll out of the Lynch Road assembly plant. So that's super cool. It's also believed to be most likely the first rally green A12 Roadrunner to be painted. So that's extra cool. Um, it's also most likely the first uh, A12 Roadrunner to be sold in the state of Ohio. And lastly, what makes this car stand out today is that it is one of the lowest mileage examples of A12 cars that are out there. This particular car has 7,661 documented original miles. This car was a race car almost from day one and saw very, very little street use. So just how many of these A12 Roadrunners are in existence today? How many have survived? Well, it's kind of hard to say 100%, but we do have an idea thanks to the A12 registry. According to the registry, there are about 250 of these A12 Roadrunners that are left today. And of those 250 um, Roadrunners, um, just over 100 of them are coupes like this car and about half of those coupes are four-speed cars. And so you're looking at about, you know, about 50 cars that are optioned like this one. 
And then, of course, when you get into color, this rally green color, the numbers are going to come down even further. So uh, my guess is probably 10 to 15 rally green four-speed coupes are, um, are around today. In 2011, when I found this car for sale, um, I found it odd that I wasn't actually buying the car or getting information about the car from the person who owned it. I was actually getting information about the car uh, through kind of a middleman, but it ended up actually being a blessing in disguise because that middleman was Dave Watt. Dave Watt is one of the premier experts on A12 cars. He documents a lot of these cars and he actually runs the A12 registry. This was a local A12 car to, um, to Dave and Dave knew of the car. So he had a lot of information to give me about the car um, that I wouldn't have been able to get from even the average um, owner of one of these cars. I and mean, he gave me like really some deep insight about this car and how original he felt it was and things like that. And so before buying this car, I knew that um, I knew it was a race car. Um, I knew that it was um, an original bodied car. So it hadn't been cut up. Um, it still had its original floors, its original trunk. All the body panels were original. We, um, he was able to confirm for me that the VIN number is stamped correctly in the rear of the car on the trunk lip as well as at the, on the radiator core support. So we knew that made the, car, the car's body um, a legit you know, the VIN number, to, legit to the VIN number that's on the dash. So we knew this car was a legit A12 car, which was um, super important, of course. Dave was also able to let me know that this is um, the original hood to the car, uh, which is really cool, that the original 054 uh, radiator came with the car, and that the windshield wiper motor was also uh, correct to the car. And so it was uh, just, an, just an extra benefit to be able to get that kind of detailed information on the car before I purchased it, which gave me that extra confidence about what I was buying. When the car arrived to me in December of 2011, um, I was just happy to have an A12 car. I knew it was special and um, it was a car that I had always um, admired. And so I just felt really lucky to have one. I didn't think about the race history of the car. I didn't think uh, much about it at all. I saw the name Gary Baston written on the window, so I knew, okay, some, somebody named Gary uh, raced the car at some point. Maybe he was a previous owner. Maybe he was just involved with the car somehow. But it, I didn't really give it a whole lot of thought until the person who I purchased the car from, the actual um, owner, whose name was Daryl Steiger, who happens to race stock eliminator in the NHRA, he, uh, he called me two or three weeks after I bought the car from him. And he wanted to let me know just a little bit of information about the car. And um, it wasn't until then that I started kind of putting the pieces together like, hey, this car, this car actually is a, like kind of a legit race car and has some cool, some cool race car history. Now, according to Daryl Steiger, this car is a seven-time C stock eliminator champion. Uh, it won five of those titles consecutively. Um, unfortunately, I've been unable to uh, substantiate that claim and to know exactly like what years and what events. But that's, that's what Daryl told me. And I tend to believe him because it wasn't part of the sale of the car. I mean, this is something that was told like three weeks after I received the car. Um, Additionally, I had no idea this car was a, a legitimate low mileage car at the time. Uh, it wasn't part of the sale. This was, I bought an A12 car, that's it. And so, so many of these things that make this car extra cool, they were not brought up as a sale point in the car. Uh, Daryl let me know this car was really special. And when I asked him who Gary Baston was, um, he said, oh, Gary Baston was a race partner of mine. And, um, and they raced the car for many, many years together. Uh, I eventually just started asking the Mopar community online if anybody had contact information for Gary Baston. And so a man by the name of Tom Kelly um, reached out to me and said, yeah, I know Gary quite well. Um, I actually bought a um, V-code Plymouth Cuda from him um, many years ago. 
and I have his phone number, so I, I think he'd be okay with me, um, you know, passing along the phone number. So I called Gary Baston, and he was really, really excited to talk about the car. And so eventually we made plans to meet. So I flew out to, um, to Indiana, and I actually met with Tom Kelly. I met with Dave Watt. Um, and then later that day, I had lunch with Gary Baston. Uh, we, we sat and talked for hours about this car, and he was able to give me just um, a lot of awesome information about, about the car's history. He brought pictures along um, and showed me um, you know, photographs of the car, which was, um, which was really cool. And during that conversation, he said to me, you know, I'm still pretty good friends with Daryl Steiger. Let me give him a call and see if he's available. So Daryl Steiger ends up coming to lunch at this Steak and Shake where, where uh, Gary and I were sitting, and, uh, and Daryl has lunch with us. So that was really cool. And one of the things that Daryl brings me was this title transfer document from 1979 and, and gives me this document to go along with the car, which was really cool. The document um, shows that um, you know, the car was, was sold in 1979, and it also shows um, some ownership history, and then it also um, points out that the car had um, 7,200 miles, I believe, um, in 79 when it was sold. So that really, you know, that really sparked my interest about the legitimacy of this car being an ultra low mileage car. So that was really awesome that Daryl um, was, was willing to give me that, that document to go along with this car. The true value of traveling to Indiana and meeting with these guys that were involved with this car was speaking with Gary because it became very clear to me that Gary was the true second owner of this Roadrunner. And he was the one who owned this car for nearly 30 years. And that was something that I really didn't know. It wasn't something that, um, that Daryl had quite explained to me. Gary, Gary was heavily involved with this car and it wasn't just because he raced the car. It was because this, was a, this, this car was a part of his childhood. And one of the neatest stories that Gary told me about this car was that when he was 14 years old in 1970, he was at Indianapolis Raceway Park and he saw this car for the first time. And in 1970, just about a year after this car was produced, this car had a totally different paint job on it than it came from the factory. This car had a wild, psychedelic, candy, multiple color, crazy paint job like, we, like we've seen on some of these cars from the 70s. And Gary Baston fell in love with the paint scheme. So much so that his first car, this Plymouth Valiant that he had, he tried to emulate aspects of the paint job that were on this car onto his Plymouth Valiant that he had when he turned 16 years old. Little did Gary know that he would end up being the owner of this car that he fell in love with at the age of 14 at the Indianapolis Raceway, which is just an awesome story. So Gary gets a phone call from his friend Howard, and Howard says, hey, I got this car I just bought, and I think you should come see it. You're really going to like it. So Gary goes to Howard's place, and as he enters the garage, he cannot believe what he's looking at because it's the Chaos Roadrunner that he fell in love with at the age of 14. So he just he looks at Howard and says, I can't believe you have this car. And I've got to own this car. I have to buy this car from you. You have to sell me this car. And I don't know how long it took to convince Howard to, to sell the car to him, but Howard sold the car to Gary uh, shortly after Howard had acquired the car 
from the original owner. And so that's how Gary Baston became the owner of this car. Howard only had the car for a very, very short time. When I got back to California, um, I decided to dig deeper into the history of this car and to see if I could find any information, especially after you know, all these different stories I had been told by, by Gary and Daryl. And so they had mentioned that the, uh, you know, the original owner was Dan Carollis and that he raced the car with his, with his brother. And so uh, I looked up Dan Carollis, who you know, they had told me had passed away, and I found his obituary. And I looked to see who he was survived by, and it said that Dan Carollis was survi survived by his younger brother, Carl. And um, I thought, well, wait, maybe, you know, maybe Carl is still alive. And so I found a phone number online for Carl and gave him a call. And lo and behold, Carl answered the phone. I was really, really excited when that happened. And I told Carl who I was and that I owned this 1969 uh, Roadrunner green four-speed car and that I thought, you know, it had belonged to his brother. And he paused for a minute and said, my brother didn't own a green 1969 four-speed Roadrunner, but I did. And at that moment, I knew I was talking to the original owner, which was just really cool. And that was the first of several conversations that I had with Carl Carollis about how he bought this car and the different stories that he had racing this car with his brother. And that's really where the true history and the true story of this car begin. When I bought this 383, I, I was working for GM. I worked, I worked at a plant called Delco Marine. They made all the transmission, brake calibers, uh, your anti-lock brakes, all this stuff. Anyway, uh, he called me and said, God, Carl, they just got this green 446 pack in. I said, are you shitting me? He said, no, man. Well, I went to the floor and said, hey, man, I just got a Mertz call. I got to get out of here. <laughs> so and I jumped in the car and I drove down there. And it was the very, very first 446 pack that hit the state of Ohio. Okay. And it's what they call Rally Green. Right. And I... Uh, I, uh, anyway, the one of the salesmen, his name was Danny Hamlin, Denny Ham, Hamlin, and he said, Carl, you are going to trade that car in for that. I said, hell yeah, I am. He said, you're going to lose your butt, man. Mm -hmm. I, I want that 446 back. Okay. I'm single, you know. Right. So, uh, anyway, old man Cantrell, that was the name of the, the Chrysler deal, the Cantrell and Guy. Say that again. What was the name of it? Cantrell and Guy. Okay. They, it's in Kettering, Ohio. Okay. And he called me in his office. He sat me down. He said, okay, Carl, here's what I would like. I know you want this car. And I said, yes, sir. I definitely want it. He said, I need for you for two weeks to let me let it sit in my showroom for two more weeks because I got one more coming in. Okay. And I said, yeah, okay. Now what are you going to do for me? <laughs> and he said, about $300. So that's all I lost on trade him with 300 bucks. Okay. Now, I mean, I can live with that. Sure. And that... Uh, Mr. Hamlin, I knew him real well. My brother was service manager there at Cantrell Guy. Okay. And anyway, he said, Carl, he must really like you because that's the first time I ever seen him do that. One of the stories that I heard from um, Gary Baston and Daryl um, was that there are a lot of fairly, fairly well-known um, drag racers um, and guys involved in the NHRA from the Ohio area that helped Dan and Carl set this, set this car up. And it was Dan Carollis that knew these guys. Dan 
was actually, Carl's brother Dan, was actually the guy that had the race experience. Um, he was older. He was a really good mechanic. Um, he built a lot of race engines. He was the one who had the experience drag racing cars. In fact, the name Chaos actually came from one of his past cars that he was racing um, years prior. Now, my brother was one of the best, 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 best persons for Chrysler products, I mean, and building the motors up. A lot of people came to him. Okay. He had contacts back then in years in the 60s and the 70s that from Detroit, he would get a lot of uh, high-tech stuff that nobody else could possibly get. Okay. And uh, he could make a 383 run like a 440, a 440 like a Jimmy and a Hemi like a, a badass, okay? All right. <laughs> So Dan Carollis was very helpful and instrumental in getting Carl um, the help that he needed to race this car successfully. And it was guys like Fred Hurst and Jim Thornton and Paul Frost. These guys were involved in helping these two brothers set this car up and help them make this car one of the fastest stock eliminators, one of the fastest C-stock eliminators um, in, of the late 60s and early 70s. Even Billy the Kid Step, who was um, somewhat of a gangster, at least um, legend, legend has it, um, was involved in getting this car set up. And Billy the Kid Step actually hand-lettered a saying on the painted hood of the, of the car um, shortly after the car was painted in that wild psychedelic paint job. And I talked to um, Carl about about that story, about Billy the Kid Step um, um, putting that on his hood, and he, he confirmed it, and he couldn't quite remember what the saying was, but he was trying, and, and I actually had it written down because Gary Baston told me. So Gary Baston had that information correct. Then on the hood, there was a saying that there used to be a gentleman that lived in this area, uh, his name was Bill Stepp. Well, he was like, well, a mafia guy, okay, in the Dayton area. That's what I heard. Yeah, very true. And my, him and my brother and his brother were like brothers. They were very, and on the front of the hood, there, if you, if you take the right you will go to the right places or something like that. I have that saying written down on a piece of paper and Gary Baston a week ago told me, and this is what he told me, he said, Billy the Kid Step, a gangster out of Dayton, Ohio, had on the hood, if one takes the right step, it leads to higher places. Yeah, that's it, that's it, baby. And he said it was painted on the hood in tiny letters and that's how he yep. wanted his name on that car. Yep. Wow. That's pretty cool. Yes, it is. <laughs> and so that was one of the moments that really confirmed to me that this, this car had some really cool race history with, with some pretty well-known racers. One of the coolest stories that Carl told me, and, and um, he clearly thought it was really cool as well, was the day that Ronnie Sox approached him at the drag strip. To, um, to see how he had the six-pack carburetor set up because Ronnie noticed that the car was leaving off the line a little, a little, a little lazy and wanted to know what, um, what, what Carl had done with the carburetors and was able to give Carl um, not only some technical advice and tips but also gave him some lighter weight vacuum springs to use in the vacuum pods for the outboard carburetors to get the car to launch better. And lo and behold, you know, Carl said, hey, it worked. And so that was really cool that legendary racer Ronnie Sox um, had a little bit of input in helping this car to perform. Then later on down the road, we learned uh, 
uh, the shocks of Martin was at this, uh, it was, it's called Kill Care Drag Strip. It's up in Genia, Ohio. Okay. It's an old drag strip. Oh. Well, both the socks of Martin, both of the brothers were here that particular night. And George Montgomery and them used to run here all the time. All right. And, uh, anyway, uh, Shocks asked me, what, they both came over and talked to me, and they said, hey, man, that car's running good. But he said, I got a question, and I, how are you running the carburetors? I said, uh, I got it all three of them hooked in, and they said, no, 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 no. Hmm. Go back to uh, the vacuum, and he said, and, and you followed me back, and I followed them back over to their two cars. Okay. We're running six packs also, and they give me all these different colored springs to go into the vacuum thing. Correct, yep. Red, green, purple, you name it. Mm-hmm. And the car ran a hell of a lot better. And we was actually running back then... Uh, see, miles per hour record back then was like 118, somewhere in there. Okay. Per seat. And we were busting 120, 121. Wow. So over the years, Carl and Dan Carolis would take this car all over. Indianapolis Raceway, Osceola, Muncie Raceway. These are all race tracks that are in the Ohio and Indiana area. And that's where this car saw the most action. By April of 1970, him and his brother Dan had this car dialed in so well that they were running faster than the current C-Stock Eliminator record. And that they were going to break, the plan was to go break the record at Indianapolis and have legitimately the fastest C-Stock Eliminator. My brother drove it first. Okay. And then he done some adjustments to it. And what he did, he shaved a little bit more off of the, the heads. Uh-huh. And the first pass he made was really good, see, because if, I can't remember exactly, but I tried. To, the national record, I think, was around 118, somewhere around in there. Uh-huh. And the ET was eleven eighty nine, something like that. Okay. And hell, I'm running one hundred and twenty one miles an hour, <laughs> and and I'm running a little bit faster than that eleven eighty nine. So we went up that particular weekend to set the national record. What? Now is that a stock eliminator? Yeah, C stock. C stock. Okay. Yeah, my brother made a pass first. I got up to make. A, uh, a national record run. Okay. And that's when it puked. Okay, now that was the original 440. Yep, that was the original. Got it. So you had just take he just you just taken the heads off and and shaved the heads and did you guys? Yeah, more than that. I mean, we we polished the intakes and the jaws. I mean, I can't tell you all the stuff we did to that motor. Right. You know, everything. Everything you could think of, we did. On the, how many months did you drive it on the street before it became a dedicated oh, race car? I, I, well, in fact, there, you know, the, what we called our local hangouts, the, they were called the Country Kids, and it played, they were high school fast car hangouts. Right. What they were. And uh, we go in there, and, you know, and Guys come around, look at the cars, and then they'd get both said, well, I could beat that piece of crap. Right. I said, well, let's, you got 50 bucks you want to win or lose? Let's go. Right. And I'd go out and either, most of the time I'd win, and there was a few I lost to. Sure. So the first loss I ever had to that roadrunner was a, a, a Boss 429. Oh, wow. Yeah. <clears throat> That's pretty cool. Well, he didn't beat me by much, but he got me. Yeah. Well, that's pretty cool when you can see, I mean, can you imagine how cool it would be to see a six-pack Roadrunner and a Boss 429 going at it on the street? Yeah. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, we used to do it all the time. Man. I was going down this road called Smithville Road, and there was this GTO pulled up next to me, and he'd been was acting stupid all the way down this road. And I said, okay, I'm tired of your crap. Mm -hmm. But we pulled up to this traffic light, and I was, uh, you know, I said, okay. So I, I line locked it, get ready, and and uh, I said, I'm gonna blow this dumbass doors off. Right. And I I seen the light turning yellow. Then by that time the gas, and then the time I let uh, the line lock loose and everything, I come out of there. It looked like a double A fuel dragster. <laughs> and I be damned. I I just glanced over to my right, and there was a Dayton police cruiser sitting there. Uh oh. Yeah, that's how engrossed I was in this crap. Right. And I went, uh-oh, I looked right at them, and, and they started laughing. They were, <laughs> too, they were too good officers. Well, anyway, uh, I, you know, backed off in third gear, and then I uh, pulled over, and they come up, one of them come up and says, I don't have to tell you what you're doing, right? And I go, no, sir. <laughs> and he said, man, you put on a hell of a show. <laughs> <laughs> Hands down, the most rewarding experience in talking with Carl Carollis about this car was sharing with him the level of detail that I was going into to bring this car back. And... I think for him, knowing that his car, this car that he loved so much and that he just, you know, um, has such fond memories of, was going to live on, I think was just incredibly special to him. Being able to share photos of the car, progress of the car, explaining to him and even showing him photos of what the car looked like when I got the car in 2011, showing him photos of the car on a rotisserie, um, being able to let him know about things that I found on the car, things that he had done to this car to make it a, uh, a better car for drag racing. Um, you know, he got excited when, he, when, when I would mention something and he would say, yes, that's what I did. We did that, you know. It was exciting for him to, um, you know, take a, take a jog back down memory lane and just be able to kind of relive the, the car through the conversations that I was having with him, it was really special. That's cool. I really, that, I'm so happy. I, you know that now I feel really, I know other guy, good guys had it, 